From Traverse City, Michigan, and around the world, this is the Daily Objective with Jonathan Honig and Nico Speed Kirilapagapagos. We're so delighted to have you with us, our viewers, our contributors, our participants from our UK audience and our global audience as well. You know, objectivism is a philosophy for living on Earth, not simply in the UK or in Michigan or in the United States or in the Western world, but for humans living on Earth. And we've got a real exciting topic to talk about today. It is the Conference of Partners, that is the Conference of so-called Climate Partners, the 26th UN Climate Summit, uh, bringing hordes of very influential tastemakers and unfortunately taskmasters, uh, many global leaders, including of course, Joe Biden and, uh, and kind of delegations from all the major countries and even not so majors. They're, they're there to decide some very important things to all of our lives. So. We're here to discuss them with you and kicking it off with a very generous and a heartfelt and very uh, important statement from one of our most generous benefactors, Phil, uh, who uh, writes and pledges 200 pounds and not just pledges, gives, gives 200 pounds and, and writes, quote, the climate catastrophe gibberish is just another glib way for collectivists to steal your treasure to fund their deluded dystopian whim wishes, BJ, as I've said on the DO before, is the dichotomy of the psychopathic altruist who sees this crap as just a delivery system for sainthood. And wow, there is so, there's so much there, uh, Nikos. There's something that's philosophical there. There's you know, this religious and mysticist element there. And that's so much of what this climate uh, religion has really become. So thank you, Phil, for that. Thank you, all of our generous uh, super chatters, our generous subscribers. You're the ones keeping us going here. And really, I think objectivism is one of the two, the true soul voices on just how not futile and how, frankly, uh, uh, gibberish this climate movement is, but how dangerous it is. Nikos, I want you to kick us off and welcome you into the discussion. And thank you for being such among the few soul rational voices in this discussion. Kick us off. Thank you. So I recognize that uh, science says that this is a challenge. So I agree that it's important to address it. Now, what I would want to say to these leaders, actually, before saying it, I would want to ask them a question, which is when we have an important problem and when we're about to solve it, first, we need to make sure that the people who claim they will solve it, we are on the same page with them when it comes to our premises or put simply our goals and what are our standards? Because Im imagine, Jonathan, you want to, let's say, invest and you find an investor. The first thing you will ask him is, is your standard, for example, profit? Or is your standard the abolition of private property? In which case you realize your investor is crap. Or imagine if you go, let's say, to a psychiatrist. You want to solve some bad premises you have. You want to check that his premise, his standard is a good life and a healthy mind. If his standard is madness, you realize that you've gone to the wrong person. So the first thing I would want to ask all these leaders is, what is your standard when you try to address a real and existing issue like climate change? And your standards could be two. The first is human betterment, or Alex, as Alex Epstein called it, human flourishing, which means that we have a right to a happy life, to pursue our happiness, and to live in this earth and to consider this earth a home, which is there to accommodate our needs. Because if your standard is human betterment, you realize that the way we survive and the way we have a good life is by constantly altering nature, is by constantly changing nature. And how do we do this? By using technology. And by changing nature, we make it safer. So I would ask, why do we hear all the time about the risks which, uh, which are existing. But we don't uh, hear that we have made nature our actual environment because there is no environment as such. It's the environment of, it's our environment. And it has become as safe as it has ever been. And we see this, for example, with the sharp, sharp, sharp decline of deaths that are due to our exposure, let's say, to the elements, to drought, to floods and all that stuff. Now, how did we do this? We did this by using technology, by becoming richer. So my first point would be, if indeed your standard is human betterment, let's make sure that the elements that made this possible remain intact. And these elements are 
the fact that we should be free to use our minds and we should be free to use, to put our ideas in practice, which means that we should be free to have businesses, to have an industrial society, to have industrial progress. This for me should be non-negotiable because you cannot solve a problem, again, having as your horizon human flourishing and put these things in question mark. So if someone, for example, tells me we need system change to solve climate change, whatever you say from now on, for me, it's completely invalid because it tells to me, it's like, again, I'm going to, to an investor and the investor tells me uh, my, my aim is poverty. Like, I don't care what you tell me from here on, you are not a person who is reliable on solving this problem because then your standard is not human betterment. And let me say one more thing. What other standard could there be? Well, there is a second standard, which is trying to make sure that nature becomes as much as possible what they call a virgin nature, not touched by human uh, interference, in which case your priorities will be different. In which case, for example, you will not see climate change as a practical issue where you can say, OK, let's switch more to nuclear energy, for example, or let's have big hydroelectric station, hydroelectric uh, power station, because then you will think that, yeah, but wait, this will still mean that human beings have this cocky uh, idea of domination of nature. And this is what I want to leave aside. So in that case, the decisions you will take will be completely different. So my question to the audience and my question to people is, who do you, what do you think is the standard that underpins, if not the people in Glasgow, because these people have no premises, basically, where do they get their marching, the moral marching orders from? So the people who influence them, like Bill McKibben and books like The End of Nature, or people like Greta Thunberg, or, and you might, you might laugh, but Greta is always a, a high, a high of moral, of moral authority for these people. Or if you see that, uh, for example- well, I have uh, to just interrupt you. Gre Greta, so you know, I, I was gonna pull the video, Nikos. Greta was actually protesting outside saying that in fact, they're not going uh, far enough, uh, you know, what they're, what they're proposing inside the conference. Con so, continue. So yes, so my question would be, where the people for whom they get their moral status as people who care about the environment. And the, the dominant narrative today, when it comes to solving the issue of climate change, does it fall under the first category, which is human betterment, or does it fall under the second uh, category? I think it falls under the second category, and I'll explain why in a while, but let's hear also from you, Jonathan. Well, thank you, Nikos. I mean, it's, it's so wonderful to hear how someone who's a teacher of objectivism and a student of objectivism, you know, starts with the fundamentals. Doesn't start with some chart or some, you know, but starts with these basic fundamentals. And thank you to our, our, our super chatters once again. Mary Lean calls the UN conference a conference of deluded hypocrites. And, you know, we're going to talk a bit about that, you know, this because that's often the first thing you hear about this is like everyone comes in on the private jets. True. Everyone, this whole conference admits more uh, emissions than they one statistic was 1200 scots in the average year also true um but you know uh, uh stephanie brings up a, a point not in, not in super chat but we'll let you go this time she says climate change is not a real issue it's fake and i wanted to use that you know nikos for my you know two cents as they say or two pounds which most of you at this point we've got a lot of people listening have not even uh, not even contribute so we want to see some you know, Rand always talked about this idea of your, what is it, your premises, check your premises. And I'm quoting now from Gene Maroney, who is not only Harry Binswanger's, Harry Binswanger's wife, but she's a wonderful thinker and objectivist in her own right. She said, Ayn Rand coined the, the catchphrase, check your premise. A premise is a past conclusion that supports your present thinking. Her point was that if you arrive at a contradiction in the present, there is an error somewhere in your past conclusions. You need to find that mistake because otherwise it will sabotage you. And that kind of, kind of got me thinking, you know, Nikos, the, the whole je ne sais quoi, the whole reason for this conference, COP25, is, Six. in my opinion, 26, okay. Well, they should have stopped at 25. Actually, they should have stopped at one. But the whole premise is 
flawed. And, you know, I did a little poking around there, what they're calling it. And you, you, know, you said you have more to add on this is this whole race to zero. They want zero emissions. They want man, as you said, they want man wiped away from the earth. And you, you said it right. It's the, it's, um, I'm putting words in your mouth, but what I know Dr. Brooke has described is this Garden of Eden fantasy where, you know, humans influence on the earth is completely wiped away. I haven't read the book you talked about, but I have read a lot of Miss Rand's uh, efforts on this and Miss Rand's writing on this. And like most of it, Nikos, as you know, she was unbelievably prophetic and saw this coming, not five or 10 years ago or even 20 years ago, but decades ago. Um, this is now quoting from uh, the Return of the Primitive, which we really recommend. If you allow me, Nikos, I'll quote a little bit. Ms. Rand writes, now observe that in all, and this is what you said, Nikos, this was your point. Now observe in all the propaganda of the ecologists, that's what the environmentalist movement was called way back when, again, quoting from Ms. Rand, against all their appeals to nature and pleas for, quote, harmony with nature, there is no discussion of man's needs and the requirements of his survival. Man is treated as if he was some an, an, a natural phenomena. Man cannot survive in this, the state of nature that the ecologists envision, i.e. The, the level of sea urchins or polar bears. This is to your point, Nikos, in order to survive, man has to discover, he has to produce everything he needs, which means he has to alter his background and adapt it to his needs. And I'll, you know, I'll stop right there. I mean, Nikos, your point about technology and echoing Rand's point from again, decades earlier, this environmental movement is, is nothing new, has been building, but what's so frustrating, Nico, is it has been so legitimized now. It is not the Birkenstock wearing hippies anymore preaching this stuff. It, it is not just the angry Greta Thunberg. It is the, with the moral authority of the Pope himself, as we'll get to, it is the, the biggest, uh, uh, the people with the biggest guns in the land. That, that should scare us all. But before I go into criticizing environmentalism, I'll criticize a bit uh, our audience here because uh, I've heard many people saying, I was in a conference on Saturday and someone raised their hand and said, uh, well, I've read this article and it proves that climate change is not happening. So I would say one thing. I say we have to be super, super, super cautious in understanding what we know and what we don't know and what we can understand. I mean, we as individuals, I'm in no position to understand climate science. And I would doubt that more than... Well, well, let me say, let me interrupt you for one second, Nikos, to thanks, Stephanie. She is a subscriber to the Ayn Rand Center UK. Thank you. Bless you with the big air quotes there. And she, she can answer it for you, Nikos, respectfully. She says zero emissions means don't even breathe out. You don't yeah, have to be a client science, science to understand that one, right? Yeah, okay. But again, let's, let's, let's clarify something. Net zero is not the same as zero emissions. It's not even closer here. So I would say let's try here to focus on criticizing what... Criticizing the framework. Because when it comes to the essence of the science, I can criticize it. And I'm very, very skeptical of anyone who says authoritative, you know, this thing is a scam or whatever, because even if we read something that we think we understand it, there's, it's very difficult to, to see what is happening. So let's, let's stick to what we can understand. So I claim that up to a big percentage, most of the people today who talk about climate are based mostly on the second narrative, which is not so much human betterment and not so much on fixing practically the problem. And let me give two examples why this is the case. The one is the example of nuclear energy. And again, wait, can, can I just have for one second, when you say the problem, what, what are you referring to? I'm referring to this idea that our contribution through our industrial civilization to, uh, to the atmosphere of the earth can have some negative impacts in the future. And we can say with, with relative, with high probability, that there will be some negative consequences. We don't know exactly how much, but why not try to mitigate this since we know that and since we have the ability to do that? So I don't want I don't want to I don't want to crimp your swagger and your 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 remarks, but you know I I would question a lot of those premises. I would say that that 
I wouldn't give that at all for me. I wouldn't admit, I don't see any problem at all. I don't see any problem with admissions. I want more carbon emissions. I don't, I don't, again, I want to kind of, they say crimp your, crimp your style here, but I would question whether they're, and you know what, Alex is, Alex, you, you mentioned Alex Epstein, who everyone should also read. And, you know, Alex's charts say it all, Nikos. I mean, there it is. Upper left-hand corner, global CO2 admissions. Upper right-hand cor corner, world life expectancy. Upper uh, bottom left-hand corner, world GDP. Bottom right-hand corner, world population. You tell me you think there's a problem with CO2? Let's get more of it. More so of it, more CO2. And Rand talks about that too. Give the, to, I'm paraphrasing here, thank the smo uh, smokiest, ugliest smokestack you can find. Yes, do thank it. At the same time, the point here is reliable and plentiful energy. Now, for many countries, this will mean CO2, this will mean mostly fossil fuels. And this is okay because I think their development and the pursuit of the, the happiness of, their, of these individuals comes first. But again, if we can find a cheaper, a more plentiful, or sorry, an affordable, more, pre more plentiful and cleaner energy, we should go for this. We don't want to, we don't want to rely on less. But, uh, what, can I just say this? Can I, I, I look, I'm, I'm not here to, uh, my beef, Nicholas, is not with you, but am I, I'm hearing some of the language, this whole we, we, isn't that kind of a collectivist perspective? We should do this, we should do that. Okay, let me it, use the you, I then. I think that if there is enough evidence that there is a different energy mix that is going to have a more optimal effect on the atmosphere and on the weather, I would go with this. So, but here's, let me finish my thought. So my thought here is the, the claim that I made is that why the mainstream view is not so much based on human betterment. And I said that if it was, nuclear energy will be high on the agenda because even within their own narrative, it makes sense to switch to nuclear because it's cleaner. But the, the example I keep bringing back again and again and again, and might, some people might think it's ridiculous because it's so small, but for me, it says so much, is the issue of plastic straws. And why do I mention all the time plastic straws? Notice how much energy is given by the governments and by campaigners in banning plastic straws. And then you show them the data and you tell them, look, here's the data. From the plastic waste in the ocean, the percentage of which, of which is plastic straws is 0.0000000, full lines of zero, 1%. And then you push them a bit more and they say, but yes, okay, but you know what? It's not about this. It's about we have to do something. We have to give something up. And then you realize that a philosophy, which the, an ideology which tells you, you, you need to give something up. Not because it's going to have a very practical effect, not because it is going to solve any problem, which means not giving up in search of a value, but it becomes giving up for the well, sake well, of giving up. And if the practical this is the, if the, a lot. If immoral is the practical, is this a great example of how the immoral is the impractical? Uh, um, and thank you, Gail, uh, with a generous contribution. Gail says, thanks, guys. Trudeau government has declared war on Alberta, uh, on Alberta in Canada, putting a hard cap on all fossil fuel production. Sick. And Stephanie says, what we need is freedom to act, to choose, to explore, to develop the energy sources that are cheaper and better. So, I mean, and, and, and you know, better for whom, right? I mean, for some people, Fossil fuels is perhaps much better and much better in certain situations, maybe others, but there's this whole premise. And, you know, I'll go back to Rand briefly, Nikos. I think at the heart, don't give in that at the heart of any of this is man's betterment. And I hear you saying that, and I like that because it's not, you know, the whole ecology movement, this is Rand's words. Again, she says, it, uh, this is, um, they're like the ecologists, the new vultures swarming to extinguish Prometheus's fire. You know, so that's one of the most powerful lines, uh, I think, in Rand's uh, nonfiction. Yes, yes. So don't, don't give in to this idea that, oh, they want, 
man's betterment. And you, you said it yourself for them philosophically, you know, nature is at the center. That's the primary that's, and we're all here to just sacrifice for, um, you know, and the practical result is again, quoting from Rand here, it condemns cities, culture, industry, technology, the intellect, and advocates men's return to nature. Hey, they want to see us to that state of grub, again, quoting here, grunting sub-animals digging the soil with their bare hands, right? There's your zero emissions. You're living right there with nature, just digging in that subhuman filth and not having any impact on nature whatsoever. Just let me, let me right. also, let me also right. comment on something else, uh, which is the issue of hypocrisy. So many people are bringing up the issue of hypocrisy and and you brought it up as well that it's uh, that you know they show up in limousines they show up with pr private planes uh, i will never use or not never i will not start with this argument here's why when you say that someone is, is a hypocrite you probably at some level assume or you accept that there is a good premise there but they don't follow it so for example Greta would say, you, you claim that you agree with me and then you show up in private jets. And Greta would be right to say that because her premise is a philosophy of privation, a philosophy of sacrifice and of giving up. But because this is not my premise, I will not say, why did you show up in an, in, in an airplane? Let me give an extreme and for some ridiculous examples, but it would make sense. We would never say to an anti-Semite, you're a hypocrite because you claim you're an anti-Semite and here I see you hanging out with Jews. Uh, we would say, your premises are wrong, so I don't care if you, if you apply them. I mean, good for you if you don't apply them because uh, you're, th this would lead to horrible things for you and for others, but we'd never say you're a hypocrite or we'd never say... Uh, and in the same way, I think, we should not say, well, these politicians are, are hypocrites. I mean... We could make the observation that they don't take their idea seriously. For example, if you buy a house 10 meters from the sea, but you're worried that with due to sea level rise in 12 years, our cities will be under ocean, which is, by the way, a ridiculous argument, then in a way you show with your actions that you don't even believe with on the things you say. But this accusation of hypocrisy, for me, is not the right criticism. The right criticism is that your goals and your values and your premises are wrong and the fact that you don't uh, that you don't act on them for me is of secondary importance thank you to andrew traeger who for a generous contribution you know you all are helping us keep this you know if you want to talk about an alternative perspective an alternative voice i mean you know one right-wing group versus another or one left group you know objectivism is really among the sole voices of reason out there, certainly, and especially in this issue, Andrew's contribution helps keep us going. He says, if climate change is a problem, vaccines are a problem because of side effects. Um, thank you for that. I don't know, Nikos, do you want to pop in on that one? Yeah, that's a good point in terms of, and again, Alex Epstein has made this point. We should talk about fossil fuels in the same way we talk about the vaccines, which is, they have mostly been a power for good. They have saved lives. They have made the life we have today possible. At the same time, though, in the same way that we'd say, you know what, Moderna is better than, let's say, AstraZeneca because it's more efficient or it has less side effects, whatever. In the same way, it's not a taboo to say that nuclear, uh, pound by pound, as they say in the boxing, is better than fossil fuels if you can afford it. And it has, it creates, it, 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 no one likes living in an atmosphere which is polluted, and no one wants even to live with the uncertainty of what might happen to the climate and if we're going to have more droughts or if we're going to have more heat waves. Because again, spend the summer in Athens and tell me that even a one degree of average uh, temperature between here and five years later, it could, it could have a big effect in people's quality of life. So I'm very, very careful on how I talk about whether this exists or not. Because again, I want to take my marching orders from reality and reason. And my mind tells me I cannot understand the science. Therefore, I have to rely on people who seem to me to be reliable. 
but you, again, but you don't, confuse, you don't, and you don't, you don't give in on the premise that if man is having an effect on the environment, that means that we need to close up shop on having that effect. Absolutely that, not, because that is that fundamental premise. Absolutely not. Then we need to try harder with the same things that we used to get up to here: technology, progress, freedom. This is how we're going to solve the problems. This is how we are going to we are going to make nature even more hospitable by by what ways? By mastering it even more. By mastering nature. That's what main environmentalists don't like. They don't like the idea of human mastery over nation. And actually, if you see people like the Frankfurt School and people like Marcuse, who is going to feature in my OAC module next term, uh, you will see that they draw the parallel between the domination over nature and the domination over other human beings. So they say capitalism and of de- domination over nature come hand in hand. Incidentally, they are right, but for the, but for the wrong reasons. Thank you, Mary Elaine, who points out that deaths due to climate have declined dramatically in the past 100 years due to technology. Nuclear has no emissions. None of this means weather doesn't matter. And of course, and as she said, I mean, the, you know, if you're worried about the impact of weather, uh, you know, the more emissions that have come out, the more deaths related to weather have declined. Thank you for, for that general, uh, generous contribution. You know, Nikos, we're talking about obviously this big climate summit in Scotland. And one of those uh, attending is Leo DiCaprio, international environmentalist, activist, and superstar. I can say that. Um, and he made waves because he went in a commercial flight, in kind of a really the ultimate virtue signaling. He gave up his private jet and just took a, a, a commer- you know, commercial flight. And Vergard, thanks for your contribution as well. I am a, I'm in a new location as well. The, the sea was rising so high where I was that I had to get out. Actually, the bullshit was rising. The sea hasn't moved. Um, but you know, Nikos, you might not have known, but I was actually in a film with Leo DiCaprio, with Leo. Um, I did a film with him on this very issue on the climate. I actually appeared as a clip in Leo's flood, Leo's movie before the flood from 2016. And it's kind of making this exact Okay, issue. now I want to see that definitely. Well, in my, he didn't call me in for my own close up. It was a clip that I used from Fox, but they were talking about Coke industries. And my point just to kind of say it is, is like, all right, so let's say the, let's say the earth has, I'll, I'll stop sharing for a second. Let's say the temperature has gone up half a percent in the last hundred years, because that's what you said. That's your fear. Like More than spooling. that. It has already gone almost one, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Let's, gone up, let's say it's gone up five. You know, would you give up? And I'm, this is what you're going to hear. Well, you know, would we give up all of that technology? We have shut off fossil fuels a hundred years ago. I mean, what would man's life be like? You think about, uh, you know, um, so here's my, uh, here's my song and dance with Leo. Coke Industries is one of the largest privately held fossil fuel interests in the world. And they're doing everything they can to protect that wealth. Would you give up all that industrialization? Would you give up all the, the productivity that's brought us, all the lives that has saved over the last hundred years so that the temperature would rise a half a percent or a mill percent? Or any percent. I think that's, you know, that's the point. So the point you're the is, bad guy there. Of course. Of course, right. Because that, because that's the whole point. It's not against, it's not pro-human life. It's against, as Rand, I believe, talked about capitalism, innovation, culture, the first world reason. It is anti-human. And that's why it's sacrifice. To your point, Nikos, it's about sacrifice from get-go. And if you look at some of these headlines, you know, you would think that, um, you know, Look at some of these headlines of, you know, we've got 12 days to save the world. Everything is at stake. The Pope is saying that the cry of the earth must be heard. Um, it's a doomsday warning. I mean, Nikos, we, it's not, it's not hypocrisy. It's just fact that everything is at stake. I mean, you know, this is, you could go back and show them the same covers from magazines going back since the climate, quote unquote, the ecology movement started, it's always, we're just around the corner for another reason when we need to shut down technology, shut down emissions, shut down man's flourishing on earth because the climate is crying out. Meanwhile, our lives get better every day because the more emissions that are, are produced, we get longer. Exactly though, exactly because these people are not to be taken serious, 
we have to be a hundred percent careful and meticulous with the arguments we make on the topic. So let's let's go to the barricades for the moral argument. But when it comes to the facts, there's a very good lecture by Greg Salineri about the meaning of what it means to know something. And because I don't claim I can know what is the science behind it, that's why I refrain from. And I'm very skeptical with comments that say, you know, it doesn't happen or whatever. Well, it's, I think your, your point is that it's not about what it doesn't happen. It's about who do you, who is at the center of, who is, who is your value? What is your value? Exactly. Is your value an untouched? And I want to also, you know, Nikos, you, you're such a great student of objectivism, teacher of objectivism. Your student. point about a student. Well, you know, your point about uh, uh, hypocrisy. I was going to play it from Dr. Peikoff, but in lieu of playing playing it, I'll just encourage people, you know, Dr. Peikoff answers that exact question because that's how people usually address this, right? Um, they say, oh, look at these hypocrites. They talk about, eh, but, and that's, as you said, Nikos, that's giving in on that basic premise. So Dr. Peikoff answers this exact question. He says, you know, pointing out an opponent's hypocrisy is not a valid argument, but it's also, you know, how should you play that in effect? So go back and go to his website and listen from Dr. Peikoff about how to use hypocrisy, pointing out hypocrisy as a means of convincing an argument with an opponent. So he, like always, you know, Rand and Peikoff and Nikos, you know this time and time again, they, it's like they've answered these questions. They answered all these questions that we're getting for the first time in 2000. They answered them in the 70s, the 80s, the 60s very frequently. So I always start with what they said rather than, you know, my belief of, of, you know, like this is something new. Once over and over again, they, they saw this and they interpreted it correctly in decades prior. One last comment on the hypocrisy thing. So when I was a communist, I used to dress well and I used to go to nice places and, you know, have a nice car and all that stuff. And when someone tells me, oh, you claim you're a communist and therefore you had the cell phone, isn't this hypocrisy? I knew already that this guy had no idea how to argue with me. I was like, okay, if this is my opponent, I've already won. So, so it's not even it's not even persuading as an argument in terms of you know putting your opponent in a difficult in a difficult position. Anyway, so I'll we just move say to... this to Clubhouse. We will. I want to just first of all thank you all the super chatters, especially to Vergard to, to everyone. And you know maybe we'll quickly leave it with you know this is Rand's takeaway, not takeaway, but her comments that the goal, the immediate goal is obvious, the destruction of the remnants of the capitalism, today's mixed economy, and the establishment of a global dictatorship. And not to be an alarmist, but isn't that kind of what you see gathering at, um, at COP26, you know, the interested parties, some governments, of course, they've got the guns, but all these associated groups, 3M, the major you know, Dow component, major American, they're going to be there. So this is that disgusting, in my opinion, this is my perspective now, Nico, is that disgusting mixture of the uh, disgusting result of the mixed economy, that coming together of political force, economic force, backroom deals getting done, and all with us as a gun pointed at our head. Rand, saw, I believe, saw it coming, and we're seeing it play out because, as you said, those basic premises put man's life first, not nature's, are not being checked. Yeah, there's definitely no plan or something because these people, again, are pragmatists. But if you see the ideas that set the narrative, these ideas are scary, scary indeed. Okay, many thanks to... I haven't got in front of me, so I don't know if there are more super chats, but a huge thank to our super chatters. And Jonathan, why don't you... If there's any other super chat, uh, you can uh, finish us off and we go to Clubhouse. We'll see you in Clubhouse. Thank you for all of our super chatters and our regular contributors. Um, I know Stephanie is just one of them. I see Taisy there, like Daisy, and so many others. So we'll see you on Clubhouse, and we'll see you back here tomorrow for more from The Daily Objective from Michigan, from the UK, and around the world. This is The Daily Objective for Nigos Skopirlapalakabalakugos. It's Jonathan Honig saying, have a great tonight and a pleasant tomorrow. <laughs>